welcome to uh, our webinar for uh, the new NEA publication on meeting climate change targets, uh, the world of uh, nuclear energy. Um, my name is Michel Bertemi, a nuclear energy analyst. Uh, I'll be uh, introducing the sessions today. Um, today webinar will be in three parts. Uh, first, we're going to have keynote remarks, uh, followed by the presentation of the report uh, by Dan Cameron, and uh, concluding with a panel discussion uh, with uh, Brian Warner from the IEA and Henri Payer from the IAE. First session with the keynote remarks, uh, starting with uh, Director General Bill Magwood from uh, the NEA. Uh, Bill, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, first, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. We've been looking forward to this uh, discussion for quite some time. Uh, my thanks to all the speakers who will be participating today. This is a very important topic, obviously, and there are many, many aspects to it. Um, to begin, I think it's important to note that um, over the many years that I've been involved in the nuclear sector, um, the one aspect of nuclear energy that really um, isn't up to challenge is that nuclear energy does not emit carbon dioxide. Um, among the um, methods of producing electricity and heat and other energy forms at large scale, um, nuclear energy has tremendous advantages. It is um, today, um, in OECD countries, the single largest source of low carbon electricity uh, available. And it's the second largest source after hydro worldwide. Um, this is a very important starting point uh, to the global effort to reduce CO2 emissions. And we certainly saw that um, the efforts that countries have been making around the world to make even deeper reductions in CO2, reaching towards net zero by the 2050 timeframe, uh, will require some contribution to many different um, from many different technologies. For many uh, countries, the focus over the last several years certainly has been on renewable energy, and that's entirely appropriate. Solar, wind, um, biomass, others um, have tremendous potential to help countries reduce their CO2 emissions. Um, however, as we've seen, reducing emissions very rapidly and very deeply um, does require some contribution to dispatchable resources, uh, resources for electricity in particular that are available when they are needed. Um, this complements the variable renewable energy resources around the world and makes them more effective. Um, this is a realization that we see countries around the world making, particularly as energy security becomes more um, topical for governments. In the aftermath of the COP26 discussions in Glasgow, uh, we saw many policymakers leave those conversations with a renewed understanding of the difficulty of how it will, of what they face in reducing CO2 emissions dramatically over the next few decades. Uh, many of them have set very aggressive targets for 2030. And 2030 is merely eight years from now. In energy terms, that's very, very little time. This, I believe, has stressed for many people the risk of failure, the possibility that we will simply not make the targets, that we will fail to achieve net zero by 2050 with all the ramifications that come with that. Because of the, that risk of failure, many countries, certainly not all countries, but many countries have taken another look at nuclear energy as a part of the solution. Um, nuclear energy, as I mentioned, has tremendous attributes, but also over the years, there has been many questions about capital costs, about what to do about um, project reliability to assure that these projects can be brought um, online when they're supposed to come online. And this is something that has dissuaded many countries from looking at nuclear power. I believe that one of the reasons we've seen so many countries take another look is because there are so many new interesting technologies on the forefront. Small modular reactors, Gen 4 reactors, advanced technologies 
which can solve many of these issues that have um, certainly made nuclear more difficult to deploy for many countries, um, have really raised the interest level around the world, both in OECD countries, um, some of which have not deployed nuclear in the past, but also developing countries around the world. This is something that is um, both very exciting, um, but also has many challenges ahead. It's exciting because this, these new technologies represent the greatest new burst of innovation in the nuclear sector that we've seen probably since the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, these new technologies, which range from um, larger reactors using liquid metal coolants to midsize using uh, gas-cooled technologies to micro-reactors, um, very large range of technologies that are possible, some of which will be available by the end of this decade. Um, so this new innovation um, is both very inspiring, very exciting, but also presents new challenges for us. Regulatory challenges, deployment challenges, operational challenges, many, many different questions have to be answered. We at the NEA um, have announced within our steering committee a new um, strategy to assess these issues and to try to set the stage to pointing to solutions. Solutions that will be taken by the international community, by national authorities, by industry, by, um, by regulators. There's many different pieces that have to come together for all these technologies to come to the fore. Um, and we at the NEA are going to play our part in helping this along. Uh, obviously this will re require a great deal of engagement. Um, we have therefore develop a new um, industry engagement strategy, which we'll be uh, discussing with people in the very near term. Um, but we'll be looking at really the broad range of participants in the nuclear sector, operators, the supply chain, SMR vendors, um, end users. These are, will all be brought together under our strategy. We're very excited by that. So while there's a great deal of promise to all this, we also recognize that there have been many promises made before and that it's going to be up to all of us in the nuclear sector to bring this promise to reality. And I believe that this is a very important initiative, not for the future of nuclear energy, but really for the future of our societies. Um, if we prove to be unequal to the task of reducing uh, emissions to a degree that the scientists, the climate scientists think are necessary. Um, we run the risk of, of being a generation that set a very high level of promise, but failed to meet those promises. If we're going to avoid that, we are going to be, it will be necessary for us to use all the tools at our disposal. We will have to deploy renewables in large scale. We will have to become more efficient in how we use energy. And for the most part, we will have to deploy advanced new nuclear technologies. If we do these things, uh, we will be able to look towards the future uh, with a great deal of, of positive hope and hope that future generations will look back on us and say that we did the right things at the right time. So today's conversation, meeting climate change targets, the role of the energy, we'll go over some of this with a range of experts. Um, we appreciate all the participants um, today from um, the United States, from Poland, the Czech Republic, um, high level speakers that demonstrate the very high level of interest that these issues bring to um, our member countries. And we look forward to, to the output of today's conversation and look forward to working with all of our member countries to move forward with these very important issues. So with that, Michelle, I'll hand the floor back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh Director General Magwood for these remarks. Uh, it's now a pleasure uh, to uh, invite uh, Thomas Eller from the Czech Republic uh, for some uh, keynote remarks. Uh, Mr. Eller is a Deputy Minister uh, for Nuclear uh, with the Czech Republic Ministry of, um, of uh, Industry and, and Trade. Uh, Thomas, if you have the floor. Perfect, so good afternoon. Uh, to everybody, to all guests, and many thanks for for kind invitation to be able to reflect some Czech perspective and uh, 
our point of view and underpin and thank you for your study and for your for your in endeavor so let, let, let me repeat what we all say that europe is going through hard times now yeah the long period of prosperity was affected firstly by covid uh, pandemic and now uh, we feel all the consequences uh, of, of the war aggression in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, although we have been planning for a long time uh, transition to climate friendly energy sources and strengthening our energy independence, not least, we all see these efforts were not sufficient. To be honest, with its resistance, ambivalent stance on nuclear energy, Europe has missed to some extent the opportunity to cost effectively decarbonize its economy and reduce its energy import dependence, especially on gas. The more urgent have we have to act today to ensure a robust, reliable and independent energy mix for the, for the future. I think the history has shown that Europe, especially Central Europe, uh, for Central Europe, nuclear energy is indispensable part of our energy mix and, and, and life. Nuclear energy is reliable, low carbon, dispatchable, stable, with a high uh, uh, economic multiplier. And uh, yeah, it's a safe power source. To me, the climate targets, it's clear and it's confirmed by many of international organizations and national energy policies. We need really significantly build up uh, nuclear energy capacities globally. Czech Republic uh, yeah, is a country with a long tradition and nuclear energy uh, history and nuclear energy industry. We operate two nuclear power plants uh, with six reactors of total output uh, of four gigawatt. We have research reactors and uh, I would say developed a nuclear energy ecosystem. Our nuclear power plants cover about 40% of domestic uh, electricity consumption. And uh, yeah, we are focusing on three pillars in the nuclear field. Long-term operation of existing fleet, large scales, NPPs, new, new build projects, and preparation for, for new technologies for small modular reactors. And we have also uh, in research and development a few of uh, domestic, uh, domestic SMRs projects. Currently, last week, we have launched a competitive tender for, for a large unit in Duko, at Dukovany side uh, with option for up to uh, three new units uh, at Temelin and Dukovany side uh, uh, to be able to replace lignite uh, power plants, which uh, cover also about 40% of our uh, electricity uh, consumption and uh, of course, in a uh, few decades to replace existing nuclear capacities. Uh, yeah, in line with the recommendation of uh, Internal Energy Agency, uh, we are working on the roadmap for, for SMRs and we see a special potential uh, in the heating sector. Uh, yeah, uh, there is a developed central heating system in the Czech Republic and SMRs could be an option to replace uh, mostly lignite or hard coal uh, heat generation. So, yeah, we are looking forward to have the uh, technologies as, yeah, in early future uh, commercialized and to be able to apply them in the, in the Czech Republic as well. Yeah, as for other activities to support uh, nuclear energy development, it's a number, it's a palette of uh, activities on the national level, educational systems, legal framework, of course, financial models, education, uh, R&D, etc. In the international field, uh, uh, yeah, uh, firstly, big thanks to, to NIA OECD for perfect uh, cooperation and, and your, your support, but uh, we are active in International Atomic Energy Agency, very developed bilateral uh, relations with, uh, with uh, nuclear countries or newcomers such as Poland or, or traditional partners such as Slovakia and France and uh, other Central European countries. And uh, in the EU, we are glad that the mood is, yeah, is slowly changing in favor, I would say not in favor, in favor for more support for, for nuclear. And we feel it's a good topic for the Czech EU presidency in the second half of this year. 
we really want to be more vocal and more supportive uh, the EU for, for nuclear energy development and uh, conditions for long-term operation. So we would like to have more, uh, uh, nu more nuclear-friendly investment conditions to support skills, infrastructure, and also the whole nuclear energy ecosystem, which is a uh, yeah, high-tech industry with, uh, with a big potential. So back, back to the major, uh, major, major topic. Uh, yeah, long story short, for the Czech Republic, the nuclear energy is a must. The renewable energy sources development, it's second priority together with nuclear, but we have to acknowledge limited geographical uh, conditions and we need base load, we need stable, reliable, uh, reliable, reliable and secure energy supplies. Therefore, these three pillars, long-term operation, new large units and preparation for, uh, for, for SMRs to meet the climate change, uh, climate change targets to, uh, I would say, to further have the full support of, of our people, of our public. Perhaps an in interesting point at the end, in the Czech Republic, uh, if we take supporters of nuclear and supporters of renewable energy sources, these are not divided, uh, divided groups or groups against. We have one of the most highest intersection of these groups, so the majority support both development of nuclear and energy and that underpins uh, also the economic and technical thesis of, of director Megwood that uh, there is there are synergies and uh, yeah with nuclear you can more effectively uh, run renewable energy sources while ensuring energy security so once more many thanks for invitation wishing uh, uh, interesting discussion and looking forward to take part and uh, discuss with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aura, for this uh, overview of the role of nuclear technology and application uh, to meet uh, the Czech Republic uh, climate uh, objectives. Uh, we now uh, have uh, two pre-recorded remarks from high-level speakers, uh, starting with Adam djibourde uh, Chepartinsky, who is the Under Secretary of State for Climate and Environment in Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, thank you very much and thanks especially to the NEA, to Director Magwood for the invitation to take part in today's discussion. Uh, thanks for the very uh, good initiative of presenting uh, this report. Um, Poland has had uh, very ambitious climate goals and they are reflected in the long-term energy strategy and we are determined to start this historical transformation of our energy mix which is still quite unique in Europe, as it is based mostly on, on fossil fuels. And the process of this transformation will be obviously challenging and lengthy, because today um, about 70% of our electricity is still coming from coal. Uh, we must use all, of, use all available technologies, nuclear, solar, wind, biomass, to achieve a clean energy system. Nuclear power will play an important role in Poland's energy mix and in our policy towards climate change mitigation. Uh, the Polish government has approved the update of the Polish nuclear power program at the end of 2020. The objective of this program is to construct and commission um, nuclear power plants that would be representing about 15% of the generation capacity in the national system. Um, that will be a capacity of between 6 and 9 gigawatts um, in perspective until uh, 2043. Nuclear power will be a pillar of energy security as a re reliable source of electricity generation. And recent events in, uh, and Russia's aggression on Ukraine in particular are putting security of supply right at the front of our uh, policy priorities. Nuclear energy is a part of the long-term solutions to tackle at the same time the energy security crisis and the climate crisis. Since nuclear power generates large amounts of electricity, it will help Poland to replace old coal-fired power plants and will be an indispensable component in decarbonizing our economy. On the other hand, nuclear power as a dispatchable and flexible baseload source will allow renewable energy sources to be developed on a mass scale in a stable manner. 
As the latest IPCC report indicates, renewable and nuclear power are comp complementary low carbon solutions. Both of them help to achieve the climate neutrality objective. In addition, nuclear power, apart from producing clean energy electricity, can decarbonize hard to abate sectors of uh, the economy, providing heat for residential industri industrial purposes as well as clean hydrogen. In addition, it will contribute to the sustainable economic and social development of many regions in Poland. Since Poland is a nuclear nu newcomer country, development of nuclear power will contribute to the creation of a new innovative industry branch in Poland with a high degree of technological investment, um, innovation and added value. The construction of the nuclear power plants can be carried out by Polish companies by up to 70% of the project value. And we estimate that by um, 2040, nuclear energy will generate around 38,000 new jobs. For a country like Poland, achieving these ambitious objectives will require broad international cooperation. In addition to bilateral cooperation, we are glad to work with uh, international reputable organizations like the NEA on key policy issues, including financing of nuclear projects. And we were participating actively and co-organizing uh, a series of webinars last year on innovative financing. We look forward to welcoming you in October in Warsaw for a joint conference with um, NEA and IFNEC to present a report on financing of nuclear new build projects and concluding our joint efforts and to discuss further steps in this field. Thank you very much. Uh, to finish uh, this first session uh, of uh, the webinar, uh, we have uh, pre-recorded remarks uh, for Catherine, Catherine Huff. Uh, Catherine is Senior Advisor uh, with the Office of the Secretary at the US Department of Energy. Hi, I'm Katie Huff. I'm a Senior Advisor to the Secretary in the Department of Energy in the United States, and I'm focused on nuclear energy. And it's really a joy and a pleasure to be here with you today as you celebrate the release of this OECD NEA report on the role of nuclear energy in our climate targets. Um, before I launch into the many ways that I enjoyed reading this report, I will say that I think it's important to also recognize the role that nuclear energy can play at this time in our geopolitical landscape, and in particular, the need for energy security more broadly. Every nation today is certainly taking a hard look at the level of security they have in their energy mix. And I think that nuclear energy, in addition to helping meet our climate targets, can contribute to a clean and secure energy future for many nations. So having recognized that and given you an additional lens by which to view this excellent report, I will say uh, there are a number of ways in which I really enjoyed this report the Biden administration is absolutely 100% carbon-free nuclear energy is recognized as absolutely vital to achieving the Biden administration's goals for decarbonization. Uh, we're striving to achieve 50% or more reduction in our carbon emissions by the end of the decade and a net zero economy by 2050. So folks who care about the planet really must consider nuclear energy. The Biden administration has a record of support for nuclear power, which is in the United States, the largest source of zero emissions electricity. And I really believe that our recent monumental investments in the existing fleet, as well as the deployment of advanced reactors, shows that dedication that the Biden administration has. For example, we're making today's nuclear fleet a priority by requesting funding to to increase the cost effectiveness of their operations and maintenance through the Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program. And the bipartisan infrastructure law provides recently $6 billion for credits to support existing nuclear reactors that need economic support to keep operating. This credit program is going to be instrumental in ensuring we keep as many reactors online as possible to generate as much clean energy as they can. Uh, we've recently released the guidance for that civil nuclear credit program, and we're well on our way to saving some economically struggling reactors. But as you know, we're also investing in advanced reactors too, and we need to demonstrate them now. Uh, so we're shifting our nuclear energy research development and 
demonstration into hyperdrive. We're working with numerous developers, universities, and our invaluable national laboratories to deploy advanced nuclear energy technologies within the decade. And as your report shows, that's going to be really critical to the growth that's needed in the contributions of nuclear energy to our energy mix, especially advanced reactors and small modular reactors that will become commercially available in the early 2030s are going to play a key role in that growth wedge. So we're really excited to be supporting new scale as well as X Energy and Terra Power for their three different designs and deployments. Um, and I'll highlight one of them, you know, Terra Power's natrium sodium cooled fast reactor will be deployed in Kemmerer, Wyoming in replacement of a retiring coal fired facility. And I think this report notes the importance of those kinds of replacements so that firm uh, carbon emitting energy is replaced by firm non-carbon emitting energy in the near term as we transition away from those fossil and emitting technologies. Um, I will say, you know, I think the report itself is really compelling in terms of the ways in which it's possible to um, act. You know, I think your policy recommendations include governments and industry working together and our three big reactor demonstrations, as well as lots of other uh, reactors that we're supporting in the Department of Energy um, include a lot of government industry partnerships. We call these public-private partnerships, and we have a great deal of investment in those right now. Uh, additionally, uh, we, of course, work with things like the Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program to reduce costs and reduce timelines for construction um, for our existing fleet and the advanced reactor fleet. You know, um, we have a lot of research and development dollars towards both that light water re reactor sustainability program and the accident tolerant fuels that will uh, fuel the future of our existing fleet as well as our advanced reactor fleet. Those national laboratory research and development dollars targeted at the science underpinning our advancement goals uh, really seek to build confidence from the public in our mission. And I think that's one of the ways in which the US government has worked towards ensuring that the public can trust the safety and cleanliness of nuclear power. Uh, but I think there's a lot of investment that can be done in all of these areas. You know, the, um, the critical component of your policy recommendations are that none of this can be done um, without, you know, real investments, keeping capital low and ensuring that regulators have sufficient funding to regulate these advanced reactors. And the United States government, we're starting all of that, but we look forward to international cooperation and broader investments, both from our governments and yours, to ensure that we have a global solution to all of these problems. And so I'm really looking forward to the broader international community getting behind some of these policy recommendations. The United States is certainly ready to do its part. Um, I really congratulate the OECD NEA on an excellent report. I really did enjoy reading it. And I think these policy recommendations are very, very timely and relevant and recognize the urgency uh, that we have in solving our critical climate goals. So thank you very much. And I hope you have just a wonderful meeting. Catherine Huff's uh, remarks conclude the first part of uh, the webinar. Uh, and now without further ado, we can move to the uh, presentation of the report uh, by Diane Cameron. Uh, Jan is the head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the OECD Nuclear Energy. In her roles at NEA, she leads an expert team of economists and scientists, much included that supports energy policy and uh, nuclear energy policy development among any member countries by advancing evidence-based authoritative assessments and analysis in the areas of nuclear economics, financing, cost reduction, as well as uh, like this. nuclear technology innovation and the fuel cycle. With that, Diane, over to you. Thank you, Michelle, um, for the kind introduction. Uh, DG Maglid and distinguished high-level speakers for your forward-leaning and encouraging remarks. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to present the NEA's latest report on meeting climate change objectives and the role of nuclear energy. I think the team is going to show the slides. Terrific. Let's go to the next slide. I'll start today by setting out some context 
situating our discussion about nuclear energy and nuclear innovation within the climate imperative. But the other useful lens that, um, that Ms. Huff shared with us, of course, is global renewed um, uh, priorities on security of energy supply. Um, before turning to nuclear energy and the role that it plays in mitigating emissions and its role in pathways to net zero by 2050, I'll identify some opportunities as well as challenges and close with some recommendations, including recommendations for breaking the silence on nuclear energy in global climate change fora and international discussions. Next slide, please. First for some context. And next slide again. The mounting climate crisis has been identified by leaders and governments around the world as one of the defining challenges for this generation and nothing short of an existential threat. International organizations such as the United Nations and the OECD have found that climate change has the potential to threaten peace, security of people, as well as environment, nature and economy. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is the IPCC, has also identified climate change as a threat to food security, which could lead to scarcity-driven conflicts in addition to migration and refugee crises around the world. And in the latest IPCC report released earlier uh, in 2021, I, it concluded, the IPCC concluded that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. The report calls for strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Similarly, our sister organization under the umbrella of the OECD, that is the International Energy Agency, has reported that the pathway to net zero emissions is, quote, narrow and will require massive deployment of all available clean energy technologies. Simply put, the magnitude of the challenge cannot be underestimated, should not be underestimated. Next slide, please. Various organizations from the International Energy Agency and Bloomberg New Energy Finance to Bell and, or to Shell and BP, amongst others, have published what they call pathways to show us how we can get from where we are today to where we want to be in 2050, which is a net zero future. There are a lot of these pathways and analyses out there. In a special report published a few years ago, the IPCC reviewed 90 such pathways for the 1.5 degree scenario and 200 pathways for the two degree scenario. Despite the large number of published pathways, there continues to exist considerable uncertainty with respect to the feasibility and the costs of reaching net zero by 2050. In particular, many of these published pathways depend on energy technology innovations that either have not been commercialized yet, in some cases not even demonstrated, such as widespread deployment of capture, carbon capture, utilization and storage technologies, and an integrated hydrogen economy. They paint a picture of where the investments are needed and where we should aspire but they also paint a picture of some of the challenges and some of the vulnerabilities as we try to achieve these net zero futures. It is notable, however, that none of these published pathways project particularly aspirational scenarios for nuclear innovation. In other words, all of the published pathways include levels of nuclear energy deployment based on currently available commercial technologies. Some are somewhat ambitious in the extent of the deployment, for example, Bloomberg New Energy Finance envisages up to 7,400 gigawatts of global installed nuclear capacity by 2050, but none of the pathways depend on nuclear innovations that have not yet been realized. This represents a significant gap in the current pathways publications, but also an opportunity because as those of us who work in the nuclear sector know, um, the potential exists for near-term and medium-term nuclear energy innovation to play a significantly larger role in decarbonization strategies. Next slide, please. Despite these uncertainties in the pathways, some conclusions are already clear. 
Firstly, all published pathways present significant challenges for the energy sector from a technological, economic, and policy perspective. Reaching net zero will require rapid and far-reaching transformation in the energy sector, which will require massive investments of energy innovation and progress in a number of energy technologies that are currently under development. Secondly, though, all pathways require global installed nuclear capacity to grow significantly, often more than doubling from current levels by 2050. Four IPCC pathways call for nuclear capacity to grow by a factor between two and six times between 2010 and 2050, reaching as much as 13,000 terawatts by 2050, up from 2,600 terawatt hours in 2010. Next slide, please. So now that we've really talked about the magnitude of the challenge and how narrow the pathways are and the necessity for nuclear to be part of those pathways to net zero by 2050, let's turn to the role of nuclear in climate change mitigation er efforts more specifically. Next slide, please. In this presentation and the publication that will be going online uh, imminently this afternoon, um, I will present new analysis by the NEA that begins to quantify the full potential of nuclear energy to contribute to emissions reductions, which can be understood as the sum or the combination of the contributions from four applications. Number one, long-term operations of existing nuclear fleets. Number two, new builds of large-scale reactors, mainly based on existing technologies that we call generation three technologies. Number three, deployment of small modular reactors and generation four or advanced, uh, back one slide please, small modular reactors, uh, SMRs or generation four reactors. And then the fourth item here is non-electric applications, including heat and hydrogen among other forms of sector coupling. Our analysis seeks to identify conservative and aspirational pathways for these. In other words, minimum and maximum ambitions for LTO, that is long-term operations, new builds of large-scale reactors, SMRs, and non-power non applications of nuclear power. And I'll speak to each of these in turn. Next slide, please. First, starting with long-term operations. Shown in dark solid blue, you can see the installed capacity between 2020 and 2050 from the existing nuclear power plants that are already planning long-term operations. In other words, that's our minimum expectation for the contribution of long-term operations of the existing fleet in terms of global installed nuclear capacity between 2020 and 2050. Shown in light blue, uh, you see the aspirational scenario, achievable and realistic but more aspirational. Here we show what we could achieve if the installed capacity between 2020 and 2050 that would be achieved through long-term operations of the entire existing fleet with each reactor operating for 80 years. And in the dotted line, you see the cumulative emissions that could be avoided from long-term operations. That's 49 gigatons of cumulative emissions that could be avoided between 2020 and 2050. This is very achievable and very economic. Next slide, please. Next, turning to new builds of current technologies. These are gigawatt scale or and generation three, the current technologies. Um, and we're talking about new builds of those technologies around the world. In solid aqua, I guess that would be the color on the screen, solid aqua, the darker one at the bottom, you see the installed capacity from 50 generation three reactors that are already under construction. And in light aqua, the lighter color up top, you see the aspirational scenario. The installed capacity that could be achieved if all of the generation three new builds that are planned, but not yet under construction, come to fruition. And in the dotted line, you see the cumulative emissions that could be avoided from generation three new builds. That's 23 gigatons of cumulative emissions between 2020 and 2050. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to speak briefly about the pipeline of nuclear innovation, starting with small modular reactors or SMRs. Here we consider four possible applications of SMRs. On-grid power generation in particular to replace coal, um, either uh, on-grid on power or coal retrofit, literally replacing the heat source at a coal power plant. Second possible application, off-grid 
power and heat for remote mining sites, including uh, remote mining sites and also remote communities. A possible market for marine merchant shipping or marine propulsion, this market is more speculative, but it is under active consideration by some. And lastly, high temperature small modular reactors for industrial heat applications. Um, for example, for potash production, which is a fertilizer, uh, an element of fertilizer or chemicals production, um, hydrogen production, synthetic fuel production, ammonia, et cetera. Next slide, please. A key point to understand here is that near-term SMRs are expected in a range of sizes and a range of temperatures. Shown on this scatter plot on the horizontal are temperatures ranging, uh, sorry, shown on the horizontal are sizes ranging from one to 300 megawatts in size. And on the vertical, temperatures ranging from 285 degrees Celsius to 850 degrees Celsius in temperature. Some very high temperature reactors reaching as high as 1000 degrees Celsius are still in research and development, but we do not expect them in near-term deployments. So they're not shown on this graph. On this scatter plot, though, we do show you some, though not all, of the SMRs under development, just to give you a sense of it. The horizontal axis shows you the range of sizes, the vertical axis shows you the range of temperatures, and we've added horizontal dotted lines to indicate the temperatures required for various heavy industries, paper, soda ash, chemicals, ammonia, refineries, aluminum, steam methane reforming, and so on. One key takeaway from this graph is that the market, the global market, could support a range of different SMRs. It's not one technology wins and takes the whole market because the applications actually require different sizes and different temperatures. Um, some micro reactors, some grid scale, some lower temperature, some higher temperature reactors um, could all be successful in playing their role in these different applications. Next slide, please. Bringing this back to climate change mitigation now, um, bottom darker turquoise, you can see our conservative estimate of installed capacity between 2020 and 2050 from SMRs. This estimate is informed by literature review and analyses on global markets by NEA, uh, by our, by our in-house team, but also Canada's SMR roadmap, the UK's nuclear national laboratories, US DOE analyses, and others. And in light turquoise, the wedge that you really see the growth potential, we show you new aspirational projections where we've taken some conservative estimates about SMR markets in 2035 and extrapolated out to 2050. Here you can see the potential for exponential growth in the market that could result from fleet deployment as opposed to a series of one-off deployments of SMRs. In, in the dotted line here, again, we show you the resulting cumulative emissions avoided between 2020 and 2050. That is another 15 gigatons of emissions avoided between 2020 and 2050. Next slide, please. Taking a step back for a moment, um, I'd like to share this slide because it really uh, gets the imagination going and gets us uh, thinking about how future energy markets uh, might evolve. This slide depicts the future of hybrid energy systems that it will include heat and hydrogen. And here you can see a vision for how all sources of non-emitting energy can be integrated to provide a variety of power and non-power applications heat and power. Um, this is an important concept because we know that there is no silver bullet. We know that all non-emitting technologies will be needed, that they will need to work in concert. They will need to complement each other. They will need to include non-emitting sources of heat and potentially also hydrogen. Turning to the next slide, please. So a brief, uh, a brief uh, uh, few remarks on the hydrogen economy. There is momentous interest around the world in hydrogen as a potential part of the solution to climate change. But hydrogen only has the potential to contribute to decarbonization strategies if it is produced with low carbon sources and if its production does not crowd out decarbonization of other parts of the energy system. For example, by competing for low carbon electricity where supply is limited. So as long as we keep those two things in mind, 
hydrogen can be part of our net zero future. The hydrogen economy, along with hybrid energy systems more broadly, these are cons complex concepts characterized by complex and dynamic interactions across the subsystems. And so I'd just like to note that hydrogen cannot be modeled as simply another source of demand for the electricity system, because hydrogen is also a tool for energy storage and for sector coupling, which makes it both a source of supply as well as demand. This, this creates a really interesting challenges for modeling. Um, and we at the NEA, in partnership with colleagues at IEA and IAEA and elsewhere, are working on detailed analysis of the hydrogen economy to understand the levelized costs of hydrogen and to develop some initial understanding about the system's costs of hydrogen. And based on our early analysis, we can already draw some conclusions. Um, turning to the next slide, please. Uh, shown on this graph in uh, the light shade, the annual emissions that could be avoided from nuclear power applications. So that's nuclear reactors deployed to produce electricity. In the middle uh, medium shade, you see annual emissions that could be avoided by the application of nuclear for heat, nuclear for industrial heat in particular, to replace natural gas and coal or fossil cogeneration. And the darkest shade, you see the annual emissions that could be avoided from nuclear hydrogen production between 2020 and 2050. Uh, and in the dotted line, you see the cumulative emissions avoided from all of these power and non-power applications, reaching a total of 87 gigatons of emissions that could be avoided between 2020 and 2050. Um, I just will take a quick moment to note that the, uh, our, our first analysis about the levelized costs of nuclear produced hydrogen will be released uh, later this year. I uh, look forward to having you join us for the release of that report at that time. Turning to the next slide, please. So here is a summary, another view of the same analysis that we've been stepping through slide by slide so far. Uh, the darkest uh, shade of blue, the navy blue at the bottom, uh, shows you the minimum um, uh, contribution for, uh, uh, from long-term operations of the existing fleet. In gray, we show you uh, the contribution, the maximum contribution from long-term operations. In aqua, dark aqua, we show you the minimum contribution from generation three new builds. In light aqua, the aspirational or the maximum contributions from generation three new builds. In gray, uh, the minimum contribution from SMRs, no, sorry, not in gray, in uh, uh, turquoise, dark turquoise, uh, the striped line there shows you the conservative or the minimum contribution from SMRs and the light turquoise at the top, the maximum contribution of SMRs. So we've stacked them so that you can see the cumulative effects. And also important here is the cumulative emissions. The dotted gray line shows you the cumulative emissions avoided. And that is again, that 87 gigatons that we already talked about between 2020 and 2050, the same line that we saw on the previous slide. There's one more piece of information on this graphic that I'd like to draw to your attention, and that's the horizontal dotted line in around just shy of 1200 gigawatts global installed capacity. This is the IPCC 1.5 degree scenario average. Earlier in the presentation, I spoke about pathways to net zero. And I mentioned that the IPCC has reviewed 90 pathways published by various organizations for pathways from to net zero by 2050. Well, we analyzed those 90 scenarios also, and we observed that on average, they call for 1,160 gigawatts of global installed nuclear capacity by 2050. That's nearly triple today's global installed nuclear capacity, which is just shy of 400 gigawatts around the world. When we first saw this figure, effectively setting a target, if you will, of 1,160 gigawatts of electric um, capacity from nuclear by 2050, we were disheartened. Our, our hearts sank at, at first because we felt this could very well be unachievable. Uh, we put that aside and then we began our step-by-step -step sort of bottom-up analysis, starting with the potential of long-term operations, then adding the potential of generation three new builds that are either under construction or planned, and then layering on SMRs with conservative but achievable 
uh, assumptions as well, as well as heat and hydrogen. And we found somewhat coincidentally that this might just be doable. Um, if the world can realize the aspirational scenarios for LTO, generation three new builds and SMRs, so the lighter shades, the gray, the light aqua, the light turquoise, then the world could actually reach this target of 1,160 gigawatts of global installed nuclear capacity by 2050. Um, next slide, please. But before we sigh our sighs of relief and declare success and, uh, and get on with our day, let's take a slightly closer look. On this graph, we show you planned long-term operations in navy blue and planned generation three new builds in uh, dark turquoise. And you can see that uh, because, because, and we've omitted the aspirational um, scenarios from this graph because they're not currently planned. So we're showing you here what is currently planned. And that means there's a gap and that gap is highlighted in yellow. This is the gap if we do not change our plans and because of the long-term timelines for nuclear projects to close that global installed nuclear capacity gap that really doesn't look apparent until 20 to 30, 2050, we need to take decisions now. Governments need to take policy decisions right now and the private sector needs to take decisions right now in order to make sure that plans can be adjusted to close the gap. Next slide, please. I'd like to turn now to some challenges facing governments and facing the nuclear sector and nuclear projects. Next slide, please. The nuclear sector, first of all, is already making important contributions to climate change mitigation, and it can do more, but it does face challenges. Um, first, there is an absolute urgency to action. And there are also several key enabling conditions for success that the nuclear sector and key energy policymakers more broadly should address in the areas of system costs, project timelines, public confidence and public trust, and clean energy financing. Next slide, please. I'd like to just pause for a moment to talk a little bit about system costs, because this is such an important concept. Um, we have a flyer available on our website on this topic, um, so I won't be spending too much time on it. But I just want to say that to understand the costs of electricity provision requires systems level thinking. When policymakers and decision makers try to take decisions by comparing power generating costs on the basis of levelized cost of electricity or LCOE, they are comparing plant level costs, not grid level costs, not system level costs. In other words, comparing options on the basis of LCOE is like comparing apples to oranges. It's taking decisions with incomplete or partial information and it leads to bad decisions. So why then do so many policymakers and decision makers rely on LCOE? And, and the answer is very straightforward is because it's a very straightforward calculation. Unfortunately, it paints an incomplete picture because it doesn't include all of the grid level costs associated with transmission and distribution. Uh, more importantly, it doesn't include grid level costs associated with compensating for variability and uncertainty. And let there be no doubt, variable renewable sources of power impose substantially greater systems level costs on the grid. On the right hand side, you see a 3D graph. The vertical axis here is total costs of electricity based on systems level analysis. The axis heading off to the right shows ranges from low shares of variable renewables in the mix to high shares of variable renewables in the mix, reaching about 80%. And the axis heading off to the left is a carbon constraint on the system, ranging from no carbon constraint in the dark blue zone to a net zero carbon constraint along the red line at the back of the graph. And there are really two takeaways from this graph. Number one, higher shares of variable renewables impose higher system costs and drive total costs up. You can see this looking at the blue line that cuts across the graph around 50 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. But second, and this is the most important takeaway, look what happens when we ratchet that carbon constraint from the blue line, which is about 50 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour, back to net zero. The relationship between high shares of variable renewables and total costs become even more pronounced because the options for backing up variable renewables become increasingly expensive in a carbon constrained world where you have to take eventually even natural gas 
offline. And I could spend hours unpacking the implications of this graph, but we don't have time for that today. Uh, rest assured that we, uh, we are bringing this information to policymakers at every available opportunity. Uh, turning to the next slide, please. I'd like to conclude with some recommendations. Next slide, very good. The, uh, the, the, the publication that we've released on our website today puts forward six concrete recommendations for actions. Um, number one, governments and industry need to act now in, with a sense of urgency. Number two, governments and industry should learn from the examples in France, Sweden, and Ontario in Canada, as well as the United Arab Emirates, where nuclear fleets were deployed quickly to affect massive decarbonization strategies. In other words, to those who say nuclear will take too long, we say, look at France, Sweden, Ontario, and UAE. Next slide, please. The nuclear sector should implement um, the recommendations from a recent report by the NEA in 2020 on unlocking reductions in the costs of nuclear um, and nuclear construction to reduce costs. Uh, it is imperative that nuclear construction projects uh, manage to, to deliver not only on time, but on budget. And governments should take systems level perspectives to electricity policies to ensure that markets adequately value the desired outcomes um, in the system, like low carbon baseload, dispatchability, and reliability. So on the economics, there's a shared responsibility, industry driving down costs, governments taking a systems level perspective when making decisions. Fourth recommendation, governments and industry should be engaged with the, in, with the citizenry to build and maintain public trust. Number five, governments should make investments in nuclear and ensure that nuclear is included in the scope of green taxonomies, climate financing, green bonds, development finance, and ESG, that is environmental, global, social, and governance, or ESG financing. And while it's not shown on this graph or on this chart, excuse me, this slide, it is discussed in our report. So I'll just take a moment to talk briefly about the last and final recommendation. The recommendation is for governments and others to break the silence on nuclear energy, building on successes at COP26 in Glasgow of last year, as we look ahead to COP27 in Egypt this year, raising the profile of nuclear energy alongside other non-emitting energy technologies. Nuclear energy is often excluded from public and political discourse, even in countries that include nuclear in their existing and future energy plans. They often remain silent on the role of nuclear in international clean energy and climate change fora. We do see a change in this regard, but to the extent that governments and countries still remain silent, it is deeply problematic because nuclear must be included alongside other options and discussions about energy transition simply at, at, at a most basic level in order to maintain the integrity and the evidence base and the completeness of the policy dialogue. And here there are really three key messages we, go, we recommend to governments to carry forward in these discussions from COP26 as we look ahead to COP27. Those three messages are that nuclear already makes an important contribution to emissions reduction and it needs, and can, it needs to do more and it can do more. Number two, near-term near near -term nuclear innovations are expected to make an important contribution to emissions reductions targets. And number three, policies to the maximum extent possible should be technology neutral. This includes financing policies, technology neutral, structured to incentivize desired outcomes, um, uh, as such as emissions reductions and security of energy supply, and, uh, and that includes the financial measures that I've already discussed. So with that, Next slide, a big thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, we're just about on time, uh, and now we have about 30 minutes of yes. our discussion. And for that, I would like to invite uh, Matthew Eringa, who has kindly accepted to moderate this panel. Um, Matthew, I have your bio in front of me on one page, so I should succeed this time. Uh, Matthew, you're the Canadian operating officer of North American Young Generation in Nuclear and AYNG, uh, which was founded in 1999 and is currently operating uh, present in 100 chapters across North America. We provide opportunities for young generation and nuclear enthusiasts to develop strong leadership and professional skills, create lifelong connections, engage and inform the public, and inspire today's nuclear technology professionals to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Matthew, uh, we are in your hands for the panel. 
Thank you for the invitation to moderate this panel. I will just uh, introduce our other two panelists here and then we will get on our way. So Dr. Henri Pierre has over 26 years of experience in the nuclear energy sector and is currently working as the head of planning and economic studies section at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which he joined in 2020. Uh, before that, Henri worked at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris and Brent Warner has over 11 years of experience at the International Energy Agency and is the head of the power sector unit for the World Energy Outlook. Uh, prior to the IEA, Brent was an economist at the United States Department of Energy. So after that presentation, I just wanna start with Brent and Henri on your takeaways. First, do you agree with the NEA's key findings in their new reports? And specifically, you, you both work at different agencies. How do your agency's studies on the pathways to net zero compare? Uh, so either Henri or Brent, whoever wants to take it first. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to join the discussion today and, the, and to, to welcome and congratulate you on the, the great report that's, that's out today. I think very much um, I, we certainly agree with the, the findings or recommendations here that and welcome any call for nuclear power to remain on the agenda, uh, nuclear energy actually to remain on the agenda uh, for energy policymakers worldwide. I think, I mean, very much we agree with, uh, I marked down at least kind of four broad points that um, align very much with, with our, our thinking. I mean, the urgent need to address the climate change challenge is extremely clear. What we hear from the IPCC, what we understand about the climate science, we have to move fast, we have to move now and that requires all sources of, of low emissions energy that we have. So nuclear power, certainly one of those, those sources. We know very well that the renewables are rising and will make up a large part of the tomorrow's energy systems, but we need as many options on the table to give countries around the world all the choice possible and to make that path to net zero emissions by 2050 and our overall climate goals as wide as we can. Uh, and that's really going to be uh, necessary to drive innovation in nuclear energy, nuclear technologies, as well in, in, as in many other areas. So we, we can't rest uh, really on, on what we have at hand now. We can certainly make progress over the next decade, but we need to push innovation very quickly. Uh, I also noted the, the call for a system view approach, and we couldn't agree more um, at the IEA being an all fuels, all technologies agency. We are constantly looking across the energy system and recognizing that policymakers have to do the same. They have to make trade-offs and choices across different options, across different technologies and energy sources. They have different resources at hand, different expertises as well, and different systems that they're building on. And so recognizing that I think is, is quite critical. And as, as noted, I think we, we see that the innovation will be very critical to make the end goal very achievable, but we can, we can make a lot of progress before we, we start to, to near that process as well. So we need to push uh, in the near term. And the, a fourth point I would mention is the, I mean, the, the fact that the nuclear power has, the nuclear industry has major potential to contribute to the overall transitions. I think it's, it's great to see this kind of quantification of the potential and I think recognizing that those challenges that the nuclear industry it faces, but also the public acceptance issues, uh, as well as some of the strategic sort of policy discussions that are currently lacking, it needs to be part of this discussion, it needs to be part of the solutions. Just a couple of words then on, on our own analysis in a, a similar vein, it was mentioned our uh, 2021 roadmap to net zero by 2050 for the global energy sector where we looked across all fuels, all technologies, and how do we actually get there? What is the scale of the challenge? Very clearly, it's an enormous challenge. Um, and whatever the technologies we have at hand, we need to push, and then we need to bring many more technologies to market. Um, I think one point there is that in our, our outlook or in our pathway to net zero by 2050, which is again, one of the pathways, one of the potential pathways, we have nuclear capacity doubles at the global level. Um, and that's already, I think to make very clear, requires reaching new heights of construction if you look across a, a decade. 
So that means in the 2030s, we need to construct more reactors per year than we ever have in the past. So it is already to double nuclear capacity is quite ambitious. And that's building on, as was discussed, building on long-term operations for as many reactors as can be done safely. And of course, we need to make sure that all of these operations are, are safe through independent uh, safety recommendations. And that's really the, the key then that innovation delivers uh, on the, in the long term. Even in our outlook, we would also rely very heavily on new technologies, including new nuclear technologies coming to market, including small modular reactors. That is a part of how we can double the nuclear capacity uh, out to 2050 and hopefully potentially go even higher. Um, but this is one where it's we kind of it's going to be important to put back on policymakers to have on the agenda, but also for the nuclear industry to be able to deliver projects on time and on budget. And that's really part of our uh, ongoing work. And we'll be also releasing a report around this of what it would take, kind of the cost levels it would take to open up some of this new potential. So thanks uh, very much for the opportunity to, to intervene. Thank you. No, I think that's really important as well. We have to demonstrate commitment to cost and on budget. And like your report said, at least a doubling. So I think these are all converging that nuclear needs to step up and we need to vastly and quickly increase what we have. So uh, maybe I'll turn to Deanne, a question from the audience here. And uh, they were just surprised about the generation four reactors are not being considered and specifically, one of their questions is, do you think we have enough uranium resources? Which I think is a key question as we look forward. Uh, people question the amount of materials that we have. So um, if you wouldn't mind uh, just speaking a little bit about that. I'm very, very happy to take this question. And uh, I think it's a little bit more clear in the report that, of course, includes a lot of, uh, of additional detail and, and analysis and, and sort of tells um, a more complete story. Uh, and so I, I, I want to emphasize that generation four reactors are absolutely part of uh, the future of nuclear energy. And, um, and within SMRs, um, a, a number of the SMR technology concepts that are under development are in fact generation four reactor concepts. Um, so what we're seeing in terms of generation four uh, reactor development, there's still a very active R&D uh, community and uh, lots of reactor concepts moving towards demonstration and deployment. The ones that are moving fastest towards commercialization and deployment happen to be small modular versions of generation four reactors. Um, that does not preclude the possibility that large scale generation four reactors might de de be deployed at a future date. There's certainly uh, ample reason to think they're feasible. It just happens to be that right now markets are signaling demand for small reactors to reach into parts of the economy where large nuclear can't reach and other parts of the, uh, the economy where, uh, that are very difficult to abate. Um, so that just happens to be what's moving first. Uh, on the question of is there enough uranium, uh, the, there's sort of different parts to this uh, to this question. One of them is, uh, for those who are not aware, um, virtually all nuclear power reactors, in fact, all nuclear power reactors deployed commercially today rely on the uranium fuel supply or fuel cycle. Um, but there are others who are interested in the thorium fuel cycle. So first of all, we should be asking the question about um, both uranium and thorium because some countries are likely to deploy uh, reactors that uh, that work on the thorium fuel cycle. They're very they're very similar. Um, that said, today's reactors, many of them. Um, we put the uranium fuel through the reactor and we burn a very small amount of the energy. And what comes out the other end of the reactor, sometimes we call it waste, but in fact, it is still in it still has an enormous amount of energy in it. Um, one of my favorite um, anecdotes or um, analogies that someone shared with me once, it would be like putting a log, a wood log in a fire, burning the bark off the outside of it, and then taking the log out and treating the rest of the log as waste. And so there are generation four reactor concepts, and some of the SMRs um, are, are working to do this, that aim to close the back end of the fuel cycle, which is another way of saying, introduce that circular economy concept, recycling the spent fuel, recycling what we 
call waste today, turning it into useful new fuel. Um, and in so doing, we can really uh, get the most energy out of our uranium um, and uh, be assured that, in fact, we will have ample uranium uh, to meet our, our uh, nuclear energy fleet's needs for the, for the future. I think that's a great point as well. It addresses the social license issue as well. If we can take our waste and produce extra power from that, that's good on many levels. So I, I think that's a great response, Dan. Uh, Henri, did you want to try again? Yes, can, now? We Perfect. Got Okay. So sorry, sorry about that. So uh, let, let me just uh, uh, answer the question that you, you were uh, asking at the beginning. Uh, and, and first to, 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 to thank the NEA for, for inviting uh, me to, to join this, uh, this webinar. I think it makes, uh, this report makes a, a great contribution to the discussion on why we need nuclear to meet our, our climate goals. And, and, and the presentation that Diane made uh, shows how um, all the nuclear power technologies can help reduce emissions uh, to, to become carbon neutral uh, by the middle of the, of the century. Um, I think the, the policy recommendations made in the report are, are spot on. Uh, in terms of uh, the numbers themselves, the, 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 the capacity projections, uh, the, the NEA analysis uh, shows this uh, threefold increase from today. And as uh, Diane explained, our own projections at the IAEA which are based on a bottom-up approach of ongoing plan, planned and likely nuclear projects, whether new build or long-term uh, operation. And, and, and that last report was published in September last year. Only see a doubling of capacity, which we think is still a form formidable task because it would uh, uh, require, uh, in addition to, to ambitious uh, uh, LTO uh, projects, about 550 gigawatts of new build in, in 30 years. That the difference between uh, our projections and, and the projections that uh, Diane presented was uh, uh, is indeed on the assessment of how these um, uh, new in innovative technologies could cover uh, future energy markets, uh, uh, power, but also hydrogen, heat, and, and desalination. And I, I agree that if these uh, new uh, reactor technologies and SMRs are available, proven, and deployable within, say, a decade from now, that they could start making a difference. Um, our own analysis on nuclear's contribution to net zero can be found in a report we published uh, last year ahead of COP26. It's entitled Nuclear Energy for a, a Net Zero World, and where we analyzed uh, sector by sector, how nuclear can help move away from fossil fuels, coal in particular, can support a transition to, to net zero with renewables and with hydrogen, uh, can support climate resilient energy system. This is also a very important aspect uh, and can help government achieve a, a fair, just transition uh, since investments in nuclear projects, even though they are capital intensive, can create jobs and economic growth. So, um, uh, we also make the, the case that nuclear energy can support sustainable development, and I think this is a message that needs to be spread uh, spread as well. So uh, we're um, you know completely in line with the the policy recommendations, uh, and uh, in terms of, 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 of projections, well, it, it will depend on how fast uh, industry and governments can 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 uh, move to uh, to to demonstrate and uh, start deploying the, these advanced technologies. No, and I think that's a really good point as well as independent agencies coming to the similar conclusions. But again, some of the projections based on assumptions and other factors uh, will vary in the amount. Uh, Deanne, one more question for you from the audience. Uh, so given the possible contribution of SMRs and their fleet rollouts, did you consider the hurdles of national approvals and licensing? And are there any signs that some global approach may work or to help for this? Yes, this is a very good question. Um, so the nuclear sector is making an important contribution today. It can and do more, it can and should do more, but there are several enabling conditions that must be met in order to, um, uh, to position nuclear to do so. And one of those critical enabling conditions is the regulatory framework, the legal framework. Um, and uh, because nuclear is a, um, a highly regulated and highly controlled uh, sector and uh, 
uh, our colleagues at the IAEA, Henri and his colleagues have uh, the remit to really oversee uh, uh, and set global standards for safety, security, non-proliferation, safeguards, and to oversee um, a, a a system of inspections and to ensure transparency and uh, and making sure that when nuclear is deployed, it is done so in a manner that is safe and secure. Uh, of course, this imposes uh, regulatory overhead uh, timelines and costs. And so what is really important here is uh, for us to be um, communicating to nuclear regulators and to governments that are interested in SMRs that they need to be ready to regulate innovation. Uh, they need to be ready in building up their internal capacity and their processes so that they know what to do when they receive applications for reactor concepts that they've never seen before, because we are talking about innovative and in some cases generation for concepts. Uh, we see a number of regulators really uh, leading the charge on this front. Um, the CNSC, which is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission um, and from Canada, the NRC uh, from the United States, the ONR from the UK, and, and some others as well. But those really leading the charge on uh, tackling this question of, as a regulator who has been regulating the same types of technologies for the last several decades, how do you get ready to consider um, new types of concepts you've never seen before and still uh, uh, maintain public trust and public confidence that you're ready to do that in a manner that maintains um, expectations, the citizens' expectations with respect to, uh, to safety and security. And um, so international collaboration is likely to be uh, very important uh, for doing this. Um, and it's one of the ways that regulators can, um, uh, can accelerate uh, their capacity building, their in-house capacity building is by uh, working with ours, others, learning from others. And uh, there is definitely a great deal of appetite for international uh, collaboration amongst regulators to move towards, if not fully achieve, harmonization and reciprocity in licensing. Now that's more of an aspiration, um, but we hear very serious conversations by regulators are working bilaterally and trilaterally. We have some uh, collaborations under the NEA framework. I know, and Ali may like to speak to this as well. I know that IAEA also has some collaborations. So this is a very active topic of conversation. And I would say that it is a critical path enabling condition. It is an absolute requirement if we are to, uh, if the nuclear sector is to uh, fulfill the role that, that it needs to fill. Hmm. In, in line with urgency, maybe I'll ask Brent and Henri that we see that there is a gap to get where we need to be by 2050. So what, in your opinion, is the most vital decision from governments or industry that will get us there? Um, just your top one uh, from both of you. Okay. Uh, well, if I can, if I can, I can start. I'll have top two, three, three, three uh, urgent action. The one is uh, uh, a task for governments, uh, an action for governments to to lead the way in ensuring that nuclear energy investments are recognised as sustainable activities, uh, and that means sustainable finance mechanisms could cover investments in nuclear projects. And and beyond governments, that that means the involvement of the financial community, the banks, including the multilateral. Uh, development banks should also move faster to include uh, nuclear in the, in the por portfolio of investable assets. Two, um, we talked about SMRs and advanced reactors, which are uh, still under development, um, but they're not proven at, at commercial scale. So there's a, a, a need for governments and industry to work together to accelerate the demonstration of these technologies, to set up the workforce and the supply chain to make these reactors a low risk options for countries and companies wishing to, to deploy SMRs in the next couple of decades. And this includes standardizations of designs, manufacturing and uh, construction and commissioning. And, and we mustn't forget, we have over 70 SMR designs according to the IAEA database. So there is a, a, a real need for, for standardizing. And, and thirdly, to, to, to uh, uh, echo the last question and, and the comments from, from, uh, from Diane, we need to, to lower the regulatory risk. And there, I'd like to mention the new initiative that uh, our Director General uh, launched a couple of weeks ago. It's called the Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, which uh, aims at accelerating the deployment of SMRs. 
Uh, it addresses the need of standardization that I've just mentioned, but it, it also combines it with a parallel initiative on the regulatory side uh, with the aim to, to increase regulatory co collaboration. Um, Diane mentioned collaboration between the US, Canadian and, and UK regulators, but, but it should be ex extended more widely uh, to establish common positions on technical policy issues, pave the way for greater harmonization, uh, initially in a, in a pre-licensing phase for SMRs, but uh, um, uh, really this is uh, the, the, the three pieces of the puzzle that I, I think we, we need to, or, or the global community needs to work on. And then uh, to add to that, maybe I'll, I'll stretch to two. <laughs> but, um, one is, uh, I think, very clearly the, the need to pursue the long-term operations of existing reactors that is a, a critical near-term issue because if once those reactors go offline, uh, that would be a real potential. It, it erodes the low carbon, low emission foundation that we have to build on. So we need to we need to make sure to do that as quickly as we can. And of course, always ensuring that these are reliable and safe operations. So making sure these are independently approved and, and safety confirmed. Now that's just to give an idea, in our 2019 IEA report on nuclear power and a clean energy system, we assessed then and highlighted this particular risk in advanced economies. And since that, so in just the last three years, actually there's been positive decisions for lifetime extensions on the regulatory side for about 50 gigawatts of nuclear capacity just in the last three years. But we still have about that much more to go that's at risk for retiring uh, by 2030, which would be really ahead of when, when those reactors could be retired safely. So that, that would be my number one. And number two is sort of simpler, but broader, is setting a long-term vision at the country level for nuclear, for nuclear power in all these applications that we're talking about, electricity, heat, and hydrogen. What is the long-term, what does 2050 look like for the nuclear industry in countries that are open and pursuing nuclear power as an option so that that gives the long-term guiding light to industry and also bringing it back even to the policymakers themselves and the technology developers of what needs to be done to reach those long-term objectives that ultimately the countries themselves are, are there to determine and uh, evaluate on the, all of these trade-offs that they need to do. That's no, I think you guys didn't give your top, but you gave some great examples there. Uh, so I'm going to ask one final question to the panelists. I was part of the COP26 delivery team. And at that conference, so it's the United Nations Climate Conference, uh, there was a real sense that policymakers were finally acknowledging the role of nuclear towards achieving their climate commitments. Uh, we're now six months later. So where, where do we stand? And can we expect this momentum to continue and even increase in Egypt this year where COP27 will be held? Maybe I'll turn it over to Deanne and then Henri and then uh, Brent. Um, thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the great question. And also thank you uh, for your tremendous leadership at COP26. Um, I was. I, I have been to, uh, to COPS and to clean energy ministerials before, and this was the largest delegation and the most vocal delegation of young uh, people of the, the young generation, and um, that was really out in force um, to make sure that nuclear energy was given uh, strong consideration um, in the discussions at COP, and and. That that's so. It's it was so powerful the the youth voice at COP twenty six, and I think it reflects, or at least it's it's tracking with what we're seeing in the last six months, is a change a change in the winds that you know may have started a couple of years ago, but really has uh, has taken hold now. Uh, we're seeing announcements, for example, in Belgium in the last month uh, to extend uh, or to, uh, to extend two reactors into long-term operations. Uh, Belgium that was, you know, on a pathway to uh, phase out nuclear, now extending into long-term operations and announcing its first uh, uh, set of 
funds for R&D on SMRs. Um, then the Netherlands has made an announcement. Um, France, in the last 12 months, made several big announcements on nuclear new builds and a billion euros on, uh, on SMRs. And, and there are others. Uh, Canada this year released a significant uh, budget on SMRs. The U.S. has been making big investments. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, the U.K. and others, but you can really see uh, Korea has has sort of turned around, was on a path to phase out maybe, and has now elected a government that is uh, committed to the nuclear uh, fleet in Korea. Um, and so I really think that as the urgency of climate targets, as they become much more near term, um, as energy security considerations become much more uh, uh, front and center, it forces increasingly real conversations about what are our today or near term practical solutions available to us. And it forces um, some of the more fantastical or, uh, um, uh, you know, well, fantastical options to sort of fall to the to the side. And uh, nuclear is becoming an increasingly serious part of the conversation. So I think that the momentum is picking up between COP26 as we head to COP27. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so I, I, I was also at, at, at COP26, and indeed there was a, uh, there, there was a, 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 a strong, I would say, momentum uh, on, on nuclear, and uh, it was uh, r really, we felt that it was being, starting to be part of the conversation. But uh, obviously since, since, uh, since uh, uh, Glasgow in November, the, the, the global energy crisis has amplified. We, we have a war in Ukraine that's having profound repercussions around the world on the availability and the prices of energy and, and on global trade. Uh, so, so that's uh, pressing the, the point of, uh, or the need for, for secure security of energy supply. We have climate change that's continuing uh, to, 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 to happen. We have record temperatures right now in India and Pakistan that are affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And, and, and countries in Africa are, are looking beyond energy access. They're looking at growing their economies and industry. And for that, they will need reliable, affordable energy. So I think uh, not, not only do governments have to accelerate the transition to, to net zero, but they must do it in a way that keeps energy affordable, uh, reliable, stable, and uh, climate resilient and, and, and secure. And uh, when, you, when you look at um, all these um, uh, criteria, uh, nuclear energy tick uh, a lot of the boxes there. And, and uh, so I think there is a great opportunity to make the case for nuclear at COP27, but taking, taking into factoring in all the developments uh, uh, that have happened since, since Glasgow last year. And over to you, Brent, for the final commentary. Thanks very much. I, I concur very much with the, the two comments that were just made. I mean, the, I think we have to recognize the new challenges in the energy markets you know, going on today uh, with Russia's war in Ukraine. So I think this is, um, has the potential to be a turning point in, in one of two directions. And I think that's quite a critical uh, point to discuss here is that the dimension is that it's, while we are addressing the near term energy security issues, uh, we also need to be addressing the long term climate change issues. And so making sure that those decisions that are consistent with both of those is really essential. Clearly, I think we're seeing more and more recognition of the contributions of nuclear power to energy security. I think that's something that's come through very clearly with the current energy situation. Um, and I think that also bodes well for recognizing then the long-term contributions. And so I, I think in the end, one of the biggest challenges I see is that keeping climate change at the top of the of policymakers' agenda. Uh, obviously, there are major calls on their attention given the very urgent situations that are happening now uh, in energy markets, whether it's for affordability or just the security of energy supply at large. And so maintaining both of these objectives at the same, at the same time is a real challenge for policymakers. And I think something that, that we all can uh, help to try and maintain that view of the near term balance with the long term. Thanks. Okay, and we are actually out of time here. So I just want to thank the OECD NEA for putting this on, for putting the report together. And also to our panelists here, I think it was a great discussion. And I saw by the number of chat questions that we didn't even get close to answering that. 
Uh, just to quickly summarize, I think one of the main things here is we need to not just focus on SMRs or one application. It's the importance of existing LTOs, existing generation three reactors coming online, SMRs that are not competing with each other because they have different sizes and temperatures that have different applications, and also looking at the non-electric applications. In terms of what we can do with this report, I think we need to spread the word and have different people from different sectors look at it. So we need government to look at financing structures and long-term vision for their countries to give uh, confidence for people entering the market. We need to lower the regulatory risk. We need to advanced standardizing SMRs. So that's um, working with governments, standardizing the regulatory process, the supply chain, and looking at existing operations. We can't forget about the importance that existing operations has. Again, thank you so much for joining and uh, thank you for the opportunity to moderate this session. Thanks, Thanks Matthew. Matt. Matthew for uh, moderating today's panel and, and thank you again to, to all the speakers. Uh, and panelists. I uh, also wanted to, to thank in closing uh, all of those that have made the event possible behind the screen, uh, be it our assistant, IT staff, communication team. Uh, the report uh, will uh, soon be available on the NEA website uh, alongside uh, the slide presented today by Dan Cameron. Uh, and with that, uh, this closes the event. We look forward to welcoming you at the next event. Thank you.